Hello, my name is Jupiter Hadley, and let me introduce you to the unofficial Game Maker Meetup, a monthly meetup event where we have talks around the many aspects of game development in general, as well as with Game Maker Studio, along with casual discussions and socializing with game developers. The meetup is organized and run in our spare time by Quang DX of Asobi Tech, Juju Adams, and myself, Jupiter Hadley. More info can be found on Twitter at GMM Meetup or Facebook on the unofficial Game Maker Meetup group. Here's one of our wonderful talks. Hello. Um, my name is Yuji Adams. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about technical art. Technical art is, alongside JSON, is one of my passions. Um, and I actually have to give you a little bit of an apology. Not so much to you people here, but people at home. Hello, people at home. Um, I'm really sorry, I promised some of you a talk on shaders. And this is shader adjacent, shader hyphen adjacent. But it's um, not specifically about shaders. I'm not going to use any shader code. Nor am I going to talk about texels at any point. Um, I still think it's really useful, though. So hopefully everyone here will learn something from it. Even if you don't actually do much technical art yourself, hopefully it will help you better understand what technical artists are talking about when they mention certain things like UV coordinates or vertex buffers or you know, any of this stuff. Um, so I did a bit of research on technical art before coming here today, because I like to do research. Uh, and I watched some talks on technical art. And they always kind of start off in the same way. They're like, I need to introduce this concept to people, because technical art sounds a bit weird. Like, what do you mean by technical art? Surely all art has techniques, or all art is technical, in a way. Uh, and these are some of the answers they, they give you. Like, what is technical art? Well, it's the silk thread between the artist and the game engine. That's a genuine quote. It requires a sophisticated appreciation of aesthetic. Not just a ground level appreciation. No, it has to be sophisticated. It has to be the kind of appreciation you have a top hat on for. He has to have a, a detailed knowledge of algorithms and processes, which somehow is different to the rest of computer programming, where you don't have to have any knowledge of algorithms and processes. Somehow it's different. And then it has all of these lovely things that are involved with it. Wow, rigging? Wow, what's that? By the way, rigging is nothing to do with algorithms and processes. Uh, rigging is like this, this thing you do with 3D animation. Um, and also you need like linear algebra, which is just vectors, really. So all of this stuff, and it, I always feel like they're dancing around the main issue. The main reason why we do technical art. Uh, and I think it's very basic, and I'm a very simple person, so let me boil it down to simple things. Technical artists do maths, or math, to make art happen. So every time that you draw something and you use some mathematics to do it, every time you kind of make a little person move across a screen by modifying an x value, you're doing technical art. And that's all it is. There's nothing more complicated than that. If you are doing maths to put art on a screen, uh, either you know, it has to move with respect to time or it has to move with respect to some kind of physics simulation. That's technical art. I feel like people don't get this, and I'm not sure why. So here I am today to break down the myth. And I've done quite a lot of technical art over the years. I worked on Hyperlight Drifter, uh, and I did some, some small amount of technical art. In fact, my first job on Hyperlight Drifter was doing some technical art for PS4. And then sort of ditto. I did a bit more technical art, mostly to do with anti-aliasing, and to do with uh, kind of re-implementing features in a way that was more efficient. Uh, I, I kind of found that I enjoyed being a support programmer. So on both of these things, I've like, and sort of ditto. I enjoyed being a support programmer. And that's often what a technical artist is. They are supporting the artists, and they're supporting the, the grander vision of the game. And so I was given uh, a challenge by a good friend of mine, uh, someone who you guys might know, uh, called uh, Spicy Crab, or Faux Operative, or Charles Webb. In, in real life, if you need to sue him. What's his real name? <laughs> and he gave me a challenge. He said to me, hey, man, I've got this space game. I've got this space game, and I need to make this wonderful effect. I want you, because I can't do it myself, I want you to recreate Stellaris's faction borders. All right, quick show of hands. Who has played Stellaris? OK, that's a hell of a lot more than I thought. It's kind of a niche game uh, by Paradox. Uh, it's kind of similar to uh, Master of Orion, also Space Knights, if you guys played that back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So it's, it's a game where you own the stars, and stars have borders, and you fly between stars, and you do combat, and you take over the world. It's, it's just a imperialism in space, right? And this is how it looks. It looks like this. That looks a lot better than I thought it was going to. Fantastic, right. So you have these different regions over here. And also I have this place over here called the Terran Commonwealth, which presumably is something to do with Earth, I'm not sure. And you can see like they have the little borders, right? So Charles, faux operative, spicy crab, whatever you want to be, whatever he wants to be known as, wanted me to recreate these. By the way, I thought it was going to look bad, so I did diagrams. 
These diagrams took me fucking forever, <laughs> so I hope you appreciate them. So basically, the idea is we have stars, which are circles, and you can own stars. In this case, two are blue, one is red. And then what we have to do is draw borders around them. You can see where I got a bit lazy late at night, and they kind of over overlap each other. So this is all that we're doing. We're, we're taking stars, we're drawing patterns around them. Now, the reason why this is technical art, not something that you can pre-bake or pre-render, is that these patterns need to be dynamic, and they need to be procedural. So if red takes over this bottom star here, then the borders need to change. So we need to constantly, adapt, uh, constantly be adapting to what the player is doing. That means we're using maths to make art happen, technical art. So I came up with an algorithm, and I call it the faction border algorithm. I'm a programmer, right? <laughs> I'm not very imaginative, or the FBA. Um, and it has four steps, technically five, but four steps. First of all, we do a Delaunay triangulation. Then we do perimeter tracing. And then we do perimeter smoothing, because you know most of the time it's angular, we want it to be smooth. And then we do perimeter thickening. Okay. I'm not going to explain any of that, because it'd be really boring. Um, it'd be a lot of diagrams that take me hours to make, and I'd love every second of it, right? But you guys would be bored off your pants. It'd be horrible. So what we're going to do instead is you're going to look at one of them, perimeter thickening. And this is probably one of the more trivial parts of it when you look at it. So I'm going to say this. Just imagine this is a region of space which is being delimited by this line. And what we're going to do is we're going to make it thick like this. And in stuff like PowerPoint, this is really easy. What you do is you click on your path and you format it and you say, I want the line to be thicker. Turns out this is actually quite hard. Because what you need to do is you need to work out these individual points here, 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 and here. And you need, to, you need to work out how to triangulate it. You need to figure out a way of getting this to work. And what we're going to do to do this is we're going to use some technical art. And Game Maker gives you lots of choices here. So here are some of them. Oh, yeah, a bit of animation. Nice. Um, and all of these things here are options for executing this idea. So we could, you know, like draw a sprite and then draw, you know, lots of sprites up, down, left, and right, and then cut a hole in the middle. And that would give you a border. It'd be very, very slow, but that's a way of doing it. Instead, I chose to use, in this case, vertex buffers. And we'll go on to how I did it in a second. But fundamentally, all of these things, all of these mechanisms to do technical art in Game Maker, with the possible exception of blend modes, all of them are based around one geometric unit. And it might be a unit that you guys have heard of. It's not pixels. If any of you said pixels, thought that in the head, you're wrong. All of these are based around triangles. Right? Triangles. Triangles are one of the, the most understood and one of the greatest inventions in human history. Circles? No. Circles are down at the floor. Triangles are where it's at. This is why. Let's say we have this weird brain, kidney, liver shape that I drew very quickly. Any 2D shape, it does not matter how you draw it. Any squiggly thing got holes in it, it overlaps, it intercrosses, whatever. You can break it up into triangles. Every single one. And in this case, this abides by it's a really interesting law where if you have, this is an eight-sided shape, you have eight sides, then you take the number of sides, you take away two, and that gives you a number of triangles that you need to, 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 to triangulate it. This doesn't work with more complicated shapes, but with simple shapes, uh, triangles equals edges minus two. And you can do this with anything. So let's do it with a path. Let's do it with our perimeters. Let's thicken a perimeter. This is a perimeter. This is a perimeter, but with two slightly bigger bits. We call this an inner and an outer limit. Inner limit, outer limit. And then what we're going to do is you're going to take these two limits. And by the way, finding the, the corner points here is kind of trivial for this example, but it gets more complicated with more complicated shapes. What we're going to do with this is we're going to triangulate it. So we're going to split it up into triangles. And in this case, it's going to be eight triangles. So two triangles per size of the perimeter. And then when we send that to the GPU, when we say to the graphics card, please render this, it fills it all in and makes a nice thick path. Now this seems kind of simple, okay. This seems accessible, this seems fun, and it's all because of triangles. This is fun. Triangles are the fundamental unit of computer rendering nowadays. Uh, until we get taken over with voxels, till that dominates the landscape, triangles are where it's at when you need to do computer rendering. So how do we use these? Like where does this actually fit into the pipeline? First of all, we need our game geometry. So you can imagine each one of you as a game object, right? It will be like, you know, sprites in the game or something. I don't know. And what we have to do is we have to think about the game geometry, which lives on the CPU, lives with the RAM. 
on your computer. And we have to break it down into triangles. And once you've broken it down to triangles, then you put it into a thing called a vertex buffer. Now, some of you have probably heard of this before. We'll go over what a vertex buffer is in a second. But we send it into a vertex buffer, which you can think of as a, as a collection of triangles. Data that gets turned into triangles on a GPU. Because the next step is we take the vertex buffer, send it off to the GPU. And the GPU uh, runs a little program called a shader. In fact, it runs these little programs called shaders across hundreds, if not thousands, of tiny processes within the computer, which is really clever. And then what it does by using these shaders, the shaders interpret the triangles, turn, it rasterizes them is the technical term, turns them into pixels or texels technically, and then it sends that to your screen. Today, we are only going to worry about triangles and vertex buffers. This is something that isn't really talked about in a lot of game making tutorials, and I'm not sure why. A lot of people like talking about GPUs and pixels and shaders and things. A lot of people like talking about game geometry, and maybe even this bit here where you get turning it into triangles. But this link from triangles into vertex buffers never really gets talked about, I'm not sure why. So, vertex buffer. Buffers, oh. I mean, some of you might have dealt with buffers before, with networking or something like that. It can be a little bit intimidating, but don't worry. Much like with the concept of technical art, which I defined in one sentence, I'll do the same for vertex buffers, which is perhaps very hubristic, I'm not sure. <laughs> a vertex buffer represents all the information needed to draw triangles. So if you want to draw all of you as sprites, that means we need to turn all of you into triangles and then make a vertex buffer which describes those triangles. Really, it's just a set of instructions for the GPU to execute. That's all it is. So when we think about these triangles, what information do I actually need for the triangles? Like, I mean, it's all well and good having a triangle, and you know, obviously we need position data, but what else do we need to actually tell the GPU what to draw? Well, let's try color. Color is really fundamental, really, for computer graphics. And what you do is you, you, you have your triangle, and you attach some data to it, so position and color, and that tells us what we have to draw, right? So if you want to draw uh, a blue square, then a square is made of two triangles. And so what you do is you say, each triangle needs to have this certain position. They all need to be blue, and the GP will draw that. But what about for sprites? Well, we need another piece of data. In this case, texture UVs. And UV is kind of unfamiliar, maybe. Sounds a bit weird, a bit like vertex buffer. It's a new term for us. But this is it for 2D data. If you want to draw 2D graphics in Game Maker, or really any program, this is kind of cross-platform and cross-engine. You need texture data, you need color, you need position. Uh, by the way, if you're using draw sprite ext, which is a function, um, when you specify the color and the alpha, what it's doing internally is that it's doing all the position and texture UVs for you, but the color and alpha that you give that function is being embedded in the UV, uh, sorry, in, being embedded in the vertex buffer, buffer data when you submit that to the GPU. Um, that's all it's doing. It's nothing more complicated than that. So, all right. Second term that we need to teach here. So we've had vertex buffers. Now we're doing texture UVs. Texture UVs are just a way of describing which parts of an image to copy. Um, they do get a little bit complicated, and we'll go through some of the complexity in a second. But again, that's really all they're doing. Um, it's useful to think of texture pages uh, and, and textures in general as a map. So if you want to find a place on a map, you obviously need like an X and Y coordinate. And UV coordinates are just X and Y coordinates for textures. It's all there. So if we think about what's happening here when we're drawing sprites or when we're drawing any graphics, really, we have to stretch texture UVs across a triangle. Sounds a bit weird. You know, it's kind of like stretching a piece of cloth over a frame, like a wooden frame or something. So let's do a quick demonstration of how this works. OK, got two triangles. And each one of these are going to have UV data and color data at each vertex, and position data for each vertex. And then we stretch our image across it. And when we draw a sprite, we put two triangles together. And they make a happy, smiley face. That's what drawing a sprite is. Taking two halves, two triangles, and you put them back together. It took me hours to get this right last night. <laughs> and I can never get rid of this little black line that goes up the middle. Fortunately, when you render stuff properly on a GP, you don't get the black line. So I've used this word texture page, and it's probably worth demonstrating what texture page actually is, as well as describing something about UVs. So here's an example of a texture page. We've got four 
sprites, air quotes. We have a yellow sprite, a green sprite, a blue sprite, and a happy smiley face, red sprite. And this is sort of how GameMaker packs stuff. So if you define separate sprites, a yellow sprite, a green sprite, a blue sprite, red happy face, GameMaker will put all of these onto a single texture page. It will pack them, is the technical term. And it will do this so it's nice and efficient, so that using uh, the minimum number of texture pages for the maximum number of pixels. This is great. And the way that we index this is using U and V coordinates. U and V coordinates only ever go from 0 to 1. So it doesn't matter how physically big this texture page is. It could be 1,000 pixels. It could be 10,000 pixels, if your graphics card supports that. Um, but we always measure it from 0 to 1. Never more, never less. And the same goes for the V axis as well. Quick note for advanced players, the V-axis might change direction. On OpenGL, it's one way. On DirectX, it's another way. I think this is the DirectX direction, I think. OpenGL is the other way up. Um, but it's always from 0 to 1. Exactly, 0 to 1. Uh, GameMaker will hide most of the weird V-coordinate fuckery from you. Um, it will, it will kind of handle all that for you. Apart from when it doesn't. <laughs> Apart from when you have to figure that out for yourself in a shader. But anyway. So if we were going to describe this red happy smiley face down in the corner, we can describe it using your UV coordinates. So in the middle is obviously 0 0.5, 0 0.5, because that's halfway along each axis. Then the far end is 1, 0.5, because it's all the way to the left-hand side and halfway down. You get the idea. I won't patronize you any further. That's what UV coordinates are. And it doesn't matter what engine you're in. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're using surfaces or whether you're using static texture pages uh, that GameMaker packs for you. This is how UV coordinates work everywhere. That's fantastic. It doesn't even matter how big the pages are. So, reminding ourselves of what we need for each triangle. Now we understand UV coordinates. Obviously we understand color and alpha and position. That's kind of natural. Let's use our knowledge. So we've already you know, talked about roughly how to draw a sprite. Let's go through the step-by-step -step process of draw sprite. This is an internal game maker function for people who don't use game maker. It has four arguments. It has a sprite, the image of the sprite, an x, y coordinate referring to where you want to place it in the world. This world's base coordinates. So I want to draw that happy smiley face. There are four steps to doing this. First of all, you need to figure out what position each vertex is going to be in. Then you need to figure out the UV coordinate of each bit of the texture that you need to copy and stretch across your triangles. Then you have to build the vertex buffer so that the GPU understands what exactly you need to draw. And then you need to submit the vertex buffer off to the GPU. Let's go through it step by step with some code. First of all, position of each vertex. First of all, we need the width and the height, because we need to know how big the thing is. Then we define the left and the top as the x and y coordinate. And this is where we're drawing the sprite. And then we want to use the right and bottom, right and bottom coordinates as the left plus the width and the top plus the height. Pretty simple, right? If you want to rotate stuff, or if you want to start taking into account origins and different things like that, this gets more complicated. But just for the simple demonstration, this will do nicely. And we need to get the UV coordinates. And GameMaker has this wonderful function in it, sprite underscore get underscore UVs. And this returns an array. It's an array of eight elements. And we're only interested in the first four. That's the left, the top, the right, and bottom of the, of the texture page. So if we imagine our, uh, our texture page when we were looking at the happy smiley face, down in the bottom corner, the left and top would be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, and the right and the bottom would be 1 and 1. So that tells us the, the diagonal uh, that describes the sprite in this case. OK, that's not too bad. Thanks, GameMaker, for providing this function. It would be impossible to do this without that function. Next, we're going to build the vertex buffer. And this involves quite a few steps, but they're kind of repetitive and kind of simple. So let's go through it. First of all, we need to tell GameMaker, hey, we're going to make a vertex buffer, vertex create buffer. Then we need to tell GameMaker, oh, actually, we want to start using the vertex buffer, please. So what we do is we use vertex begin. Now, I've used a global here, global.vertex format. I'm just going to hand wave that away. If you read the manual, yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you read the manual, you'll understand exactly what is happening there. Um, Mark Alexander Nocturne did a really good job with this part of the manual. Uh, so go read up on it, and it will, it will all make sense. You should define them as globals, because you only need to define them once in one place. Then what we're going to do is we're going to start adding vertex data. And we do this per vertex. So in our sprite, we've got two triangles. That means it's three vertex per triangle. So that means there must be six vertices that we have to define. First of all, let's go for the top left. We've got three functions here, vertex position, vertex color, vertex text chord. 
I can't remember if it's tex coord or text coord. Uh, check the money. <laughs> so we're going to use the left and top positions for the position and for the UVs. And we do the same for the top right position. And we do the same for the bottom left. And they give us our first triangle. And once we've done that, we could, in theory, send this off to the GPU. This would render, no problem, because we defined an entire triangle, and everything's just made out of triangles. So it would look like this. But it's only half the job, obviously. So let's do the other triangle. Go for the top right, go for the bottom right, go for the bottom left. And that gives us our other triangle. And that now renders properly as a full smiley face. But there's one step, one step that we've missed. Since we have used vertex begin, that means we need to use vertex end. And that has told GameMaker that we are totally finished with what we are doing, and now we're ready to submit this off to the GPU. So just quickly to go through this again, because I know there's quite a lot to take in there. You create the buffer, you say vertex begin, so we're going to begin adding to the buffer, and then you start adding data for each triangle as you go along. There is nothing more complicated than that. Hello. Don't you need to define the shape that you draw as a triangle kind of like? Comes in the next step. Great question, yeah. So what Reese is asking about is what primitive type are we using? And the answer is we're using triangle list. Yeah. Um, so right, in order to draw the sprite, um, we need to tell or we need to ask GameMaker what texture page all of this stuff is stored on. So if we just drew a random texture page, we not, might not be referring to the correct texture, so we might be getting half of a sprite, might be getting a different sprite entirely, it might be garbled nonsense, which is super cool if you want to do like glitchy effects and that. You can just sample anywhere on any texture page. But here we want to actually have a proper smiley face. And once you have the texture, we've got our vertex buffer, we've got our primitive type, PR triangle list, then we can submit it to the GPU. Finito, done. Now obviously the vertex buffer exists as like a thing you have alligated in memory, so you need to free it if you're doing it every frame or whatever. Think of it like a data structure perhaps, or a surface. But that's it, that's vertex buffers done. Uh, obviously this is taking advantage of Game Maker's internal shader, default shader. You can do more complicated things, so you can add more data per vertex if you really want to. Uh, but most of the time this will cover all of your bases. For basic 2D graphics, this will do everything. Um, I can't actually think of anywhere in Hyperlight Drifter or Swords of Ditto where we are using anything more complicated than this. In fact, we're using simpler stuff than this most of the time. But I do have some bad news. Uh, some of the experts in here probably noticed that UVs don't actually work that way entirely. Uh, and this is down to a thing called texture cropping. So we've got this big sprite. We're using up the entirety of the space of the sprite. There are no transparent areas. When GameMaker texture packs this, he does this. So we can fit four of them onto a single texture page. Fine. Now let's say we want to create some transparent area. Well, it doesn't make sense to, to pack it like this anymore, does it? Because we've got transparent area, that would be just a waste of space. So what GameMaker does is it crops the texture. Internally, it doesn't tell you that it's doing this, it does it magically, which is super useful for basic use, but you know, trying to do things manually, it could be a bit of a pain. So instead of giving us, you know, like a, trying to pack all of this. It only packs a tiny little bit of the sprite, which means that our texture page looks like this. So we have lots of tiny things all pushed together in a way that is efficient and very happy. This is called texture cropping. And it basically screws up all of the UVs. Um, and it, uh, there's nothing you can do to get around this. Um, for keen listeners, I, I said sprite get UVs gives you eight different elements to the array, so it gives you eight bits of data. The last four bits of data will give you uh, enough information to work out exactly how to draw stuff. Um, I'm not gonna go through it now because that'd be a talk all in itself, there's a lot of math in there. Um, basically, try to let GameMaker do it for you. Um, there's no real reason to go and write draw sprite by yourself. But just as an example, hopefully this has been useful. Anyway, this has gone on a massive tangent. Let's get back to thick lines. Okay, what, how does this actually help us? We've mastered this thing, this Alt-J album cover. <laughs> um, we've mastered this triangle. And now that we've mastered triangles, we can put them in any shape that we want. We can put them into things that look almost like the actual finished product. And once we've mastered this, we've got this, we've got this, now we've got this. And since we've got this, then we get this. Problem solved. And it all starts with our base unit, the triangle. But it wouldn't be me if we didn't overcomplicate it. So what we're going to do is you're going to 
go back to our kind of demo, and we're going to make it more complicated. We're going to add texturing. And this is something that uh, Faux Operative actually asked me to do is, hey, I want to texture the outside of my regions. I want to animate them or make them glow or shrink or grow or whatever, um, which was tricky. Well, I like tricky. Tricky makes me wake up in the morning. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to think about this as a textured primitive, like a textured vertex buffer. So each unit here is repeated all the way around our perimeter. And what this is, this is a texture that is spread out over triangles. We're just stretching and morphing them around the triangles. So our base unit here, as I said, dot dash, dot dash, dot dash, which probably means something in Morse code, I'm not sure what it is, looks like this. That's our base unit. For chemistry people in here, this is our monomer of our polymer chain. <laughs> what I'm gonna do is gonna turn this straight into a sprite. This is just our sprite. And once we've got this sprite, then we can just texture it all the way around by repeating the texture. Now, I said the UV coordinates go from 0, 0 to 1, 1, and that is true, but we've got this special fun function, GPU set text repeat. And this is GL text repeat for people who use OpenGL. Um, what this is gonna let us do is it'll let us create a quad, so this is two triangles, and it will let us specify a UV coordinate greater than one. And what this means is that when the GPU gets a hold of it, it looks like this. So at the midpoint, it says, oh, you've got a number greater than one. Better drop it down to zero. So it's just doing the modulo of the number. Um, and that means we can get repeating textures um, over and over again for as far as we want without having to do weird mathematics or, or redefine vertex buffers or anything complicated like that. Although keen-eyed people will have noticed it only works for certain UV ranges because once the, uh, the UV coordinate that we give it gets bigger than one, then it loops back to zero. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Because um, we know that our sprites, when we put them on texture pages, might not kind of fit in properly um, in, into this range. How are we going to deal with this? Well, good news, there's a cheat mode in Game Maker. Forces your sprites to use these to, to 0, 0.0 yeah, 0, 0 to 1, 1. And it's located in the sprite properties. In plain of day, it's called separate texture page. And what this does is when it packs the sprite, it'll put it onto its own texture page so that it has UV coordinates from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Uh, disclaimer, this doesn't always work. <laughs> uh, if there's any texture cropping, it might not work properly. But if you're careful, it usually is OK. And most of the time, it's fine. And if you're doing texture stretching across paths, you're not going to notice it anyway. Um, if it's good enough for 3D graphics, it's good enough for us at 2D. So here's our monomer. Then we're going to have two of them. We might as well have four of them. Why not? We can have as many as we want. We can even stretch them around our path, get them to go around corners. And what this means is that when we've got paths like this, perimeters that look like this, it means we can go wild. We can have them look like this, which is very programmer art, I will admit. But you can do really cool things with this. You can have them glow. You can have them animate. You can have them do whatever you want them to do. And once we've got this far, well, you know I said that we could separate any 2D shape into triangles. Well, there's no reason we can't fill in this region and turn it into fish. This is the fish people, and they're fighting against walnut. Because those are the default textures I found in PowerPoint. And we can do anything that we want, right? We could, we could let our imaginations go wild with walnut and fish. <laughs> I was so tired when I did this. <laughs> OK, great, fantastic. We have now done maths to make art happen. We are now technical artists. Well done, everybody. Well done for sticking with it. And we have become technical artists by taking advantage of all of the options that GameMaker provide us to use technical art. In this case, we did vertex buffers, but you could do anything else. Now that we've mastered triangles, we understand triangles, we could do any of these things. We understand where triangles fit into our pipeline right in the middle, basically, in vertex buffers too. That means we can draw sprites, and we understand all of this code here. We know how to build vertex buffers. And that means we can turn boring little stars like this into elaborate fantasies <laughs> all through the power of triangles. One last thing. I was doing some research on this about computational geometry, because this is kind of also computational geometry, some of it. Uh, and I looked here, I was like, oh, what's this, a citation? I like citations. And I looked here, oh, computational geometry, second revised edition, polygon triangulation, part 40, pages 45 to 61. Then I looked again. Then I looked again. Oh, 
<laughs> what? Huh? Mark Overmars is the guy who made Game Maker back in 1999. He invented Game Maker. He also apparently invented a bunch of computational geometry and also made groundbreaking, internationally acclaimed work in pathfinding. The pathfinding system in Game Maker is the best possible, provably. It's incredible. Uh, and it's all thanks to this guy that we are here and talking about technical art, not only because of Game Maker, but because he invented bits of it. Thank you.